our scripture lesson this morning comes from 2 Timothy, a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 and 16 through 18. Hear now God's holy word. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for us the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had something that made you take stock of your life? something that made you evaluate the way you've lived. Maybe it's a milestone birthday. Uh, maybe it's the death of a friend or the approach of your retirement. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Or maybe you just decide that it's time to reflect. Well, whatever it is, it gives us a chance to think back over our life. And in today's reading, the Apostle Paul finds himself in just such a position. He is in jail, waiting to be executed. And from the sounds of the letter, that execution is imminent. So he's had the time and the impetus to evaluate his life. And as part of his reflection, he writes a letter to Timothy. Now, Timothy is his protege and his son in the faith. And in his letter, Paul sends his love, his guidance, his wisdom, and his support to Timothy. His goal is to prepare Timothy for his impending death and to equip Timothy with all that he needs to maintain a life of faith and keep on doing the work of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. As Paul reflects on his life in his letter, and we read just a little tiny part of it, and I encourage you all to read the whole letter, he talks a lot about God's love, mercy, and grace. He does mention the suffering and the persecution he has experienced, but he also declares that he has fought the good fight, he has finished the race, has kept the faith, and is looking forward to receiving the crown of righteousness. Those words are the mark of a well-lived life. As his life draws to a close, Paul doesn't talk about having any regrets of things he has, hasn't done, or remorse for things that he did. He is focused on God's faithfulness to him and the way that God has used him to build God's kingdom. Now, if you've read the New Testament, you know about Paul. In the third chapter of Philippians, he gives his credentials. He was a Pharisee, which was a group that demanded the strictest obedience to Jewish law. And 
he says that he obeyed that law so carefully that he was never accused of any fault. He was also well-educated and very passionate about anything that he did. In order to keep his religion pure, there was a time when he vigorously persecuted the followers of Christ Jesus. But all that changed when he met Christ on the Damascus Road. This meeting dramatically changed Paul's life. In fact, it made a, his life made a 180 degree turn. From that meeting until his death, he followed the Lord wherever the Lord led and, whatever, and did whatever it was that God wanted him to do. For Paul, that meant being a missionary to the Gentiles, which was completely against what he would have considered holy or righteous prior to meeting Jesus. Now, he still had his religious zeal that he was known for, but it was different after he met Christ. He no longer focused on protecting the purity of his religion, on protecting it from outsiders. He became focused on including people in the faith, people who had previously been denied any access to religion. His meeting with Christ Jesus changed him from being exclusive in his beliefs to being inclusive, and he spent the rest of his life spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Now, when he wrote this letter to Timothy, he didn't bemoan what he had been in his previous life or talk about any regret he had for the things that he had done, those persecutions. He only talked about what his life was like after he met Christ Jesus. He didn't carry shame or regret for past actions because he trusted his Lord and Savior and knew that God didn't hold his previous ways against him. He took to heart the phrase from Psalm 103 that says that God has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. He had experienced the power of divine love, so he didn't worry about what God thought of him because he knew that the, God, that the Lord looked on him with eyes of love, and he wanted everyone to experience that love. He spent the rest of his life walking the path that God asked him to, and it was a grueling path. He suffered hardships, ran into much trouble, was beaten, stoned, jailed, and vilified by people who had previously been his friends. And here he is now at the end of his life in prison awaiting execution. But even though his life hasn't been easy, he knows that he has fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith. His relationship with the Lord saw him through all the difficult times, and he knew that God was standing with him through it all. And so God's presence gave him the courage and the endurance he needed for whatever he faced. For Paul, a well-lived life was one spent in relationship with Jesus Christ, where he listened to and acted on the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and he did whatever it was that God called him to do. I believe that this is the recipe for a well-lived life even today. We live our most fulfilling life, the one where we can flourish when we have a relationship with the Lord, pay attention to the leadings of the Holy Spirit, and do whatever it is that God calls us to do.
Now, not all of us are called to be missionaries like Paul, but God has a calling for each and every one of us. For some, our vocation, our job, lines up with our calling, while for others, we follow God's lead into volunteer work or into the way we care for our family and friends. God created each of us as unique human beings. And so each of us will have a little bit different call than everybody else. But we will each find fulfillment and be able to flourish when we pay attention to God's call on our lives and follow it. I think we can learn a lot from Paul. We all need to encounter Christ Jesus and develop a relationship with him. Once we enter into this relationship, it should change our lives, just like it did Paul's. Experiencing God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness changes us. We are then able to love more freely, extend grace more easily, show mercy more willingly, and forgive more readily. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, that we are loved by the creator of the universe who wants a relationship with, with us and cares for us on such a personal level that God knows our names and the number of hairs on our heads. When we know this good news of Christ Jesus, we will want to share it, just like Paul did. We will be able to see with the Lord's eyes that everyone is a beloved child and who deserves our love and respect, and we will want to treat them accordingly. Now, these verses from 2 Timothy that I read earlier have a special place in my heart, and they have for a long time. When my mother died, my sister and I met with the pastor, like you tend to, to get ready for a, a funeral service. And even though he knew, knew Mama well, he asked us what verses we thought about when we thought about our mother. And these verses from 2 Timothy came to my mind. Uh, he asked me, why do you say that? And so I told him that Mama had health issues off and on throughout her whole life, starting when she was really young. Uh, but they might slow her down. They never stopped her. So she fought the good fight. Then, when my daddy had a major stroke, she chose to keep him at home. And through those last eight years of his life, took care of him. They were increasingly tough years, and she needed more and more help as time went on. But she finished the race. She also knew how important a relationship with Christ was. So she spent time each day, quiet time, in prayer and Bible reading. And she also participated in or led various Bible studies so that she could learn more about God and her faith and also have the fellowship of spiritual friends who would pray for and with her and give her the support she needed. So she kept the faith. And her faith enabled her to persevere, to take care of my father, to be a good mother, a great friend, and in the end, to face her own death with confidence and strength. When her time on earth was getting short, I saw that she had that peace of God that passes all understanding. She looked forward to meeting Christ Jesus face to face and receiving her crown of righteousness. My mother had met the Lord and that encounter changed her life. She lived in relationship with the Lord and let God's love transform her. 
Her life echoed these words from a Rich Mullins song that I love. Um, he sings, Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Just like my mother and Paul, when we have a relationship with Christ Jesus and let God's love transform us, our lives will echo the words of this song. We all need an encounter with Christ Jesus that changes our lives. As we meet the Lord and start a relationship, we will be transformed. It's a long process, one that we Methodists call sanctification. Uh, but as we grow in relationship with the Lord, our lives will be filled with love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And we, when we live lives in step with the Lord, we will have the well-lived lives because God will give us the ability to fight the good fight, keep the faith, and finish the race so that we too can receive our crown of righteousness. Thanks be to God. And now if you will rise for the final hymn, there is a typo in your bulletin. It is actually hymn 399. And during the last verse, if our new members will come forward. the congregation to please be seated and to turn to page 38 in the front of your hymn books as we receive these wonderful members into the life of our congregation. I want you to know that these persons standing before us today have embraced this congregation because of the love, the hospitality, and the grace with which you have already welcomed them. And 
I look forward to our time of fellowship following this service today. We're asking them to take selfies or to tell us that they need us to take a photo of them so that we can place your photos in our Connection newsletter and let other people know who you are and associate your names with your faces. But I also want to encourage everybody in the congregation, if you haven't already, um, to take your photos and send them to our Director of Communications, Jane Peterson, and she will make sure that your pictures are in our church directory so we can all grow in knowing each other and you'll help these new members know your name just as you know their name. Some of these wonderful folks are joining us by transfer of their membership from other United Methodist churches. Some of them are joining us by profession of faith today. And so I want to ask each one of you, um, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And as members of this congregation paid in its ministries, by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Beautiful. And so now I want to ask you, those of you who are members already of Washington Street, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks. And we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, and in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to turn around so that I might introduce you one by one to the congregation. This is Chris Kirby joining us. This is David Warden. And right here we have Ellen Parker and we have Joe Plow. We have Ben Schuler and Deborah Schuler and Jetty Hunt. Let's welcome these members to our congregation. I want to extend to each one of you the right hand of fellowship as Austin prepares for our benediction. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and head out towards Christ Chapel to be in that fellowship area with the donuts and the coffee so that everyone can welcome you there. And now if you will rise for the benediction, please. Loving God, let us live our faith, be transformed by you, fight the good fight, keep the faith, and finish the race so that we all may receive the crown of righteousness at the end of our lives. Amen. Let us not depart, depart, please, blessed Jesus. Send us to our homes because God in our hearts. Let not the busy world claim our loyalties. Keep us ever mindful, dear Lord, of thee.